Very good to see you all here and welcome. Um, I'm going to introduce myself first and then uh, briefly the, the panelists. Um, I'm Sunil Kilnani. I'm the director of the India Institute here at King's College London. Um, and I most recently have a book out called Incarnations, A History of India in 50 Lives, which is a history of India really from the Buddha to Mukesh Ambani. Um, and I'm also at work on a book on Nehru. Um, we have a very interesting uh, and mixed panel, mixed in the sense of different perspectives that they bring to historical events. Um, we have Rhiannon Jenkins Tsang, who is a novelist um, who writes historical novels and has written her first, her first novel was about China, set in China uh, in the 20th century. And she last year published a novel called The Last Viceroy, which is the story uh, of Edwina Mountbatten in India, um, told through the eyes of a aide, a, a special assistant to Lady Mountbatten, who accompanied her to India. We then have Barney White Spunner, who is a military general who served in the Middle East and in Iraq, uh, and who is also a military historian. So he brings a very distinctive perspective, both as a practitioner and as a historian of military matters. And he has most recently published a book last year uh, about partition, um, a, uh, about the year 1947, um, and all the different events that went into that. Um, and then we have Alex von Tanzelman, who is a historian, a historian of the 20th century. Um, she published her first book uh, about India um, called Indian Summer. And it was also set in the mid-1940s, particularly in the run-up to uh, partition in August 1947. And she's most recently published a book about the Hungary and Suez crises of 1956. She's also a screenwriter, so she brings a perspective of film to it. So um, it's, as I say, a kind of range of different perspectives. And the, mo the moment that we're talking about has been, in 1947, has been variously described as the transfer of power, independence, partition. Um, and as you can see, even in those three terms, there are events that can't really be captured in one single description. They're, they're, they're sort of, they're almost over-invested with meaning. Um, and, and, and that's, I think, one of the things that we will, we, we will be talking about. Um, there are also, I think there's a kind of paradox about partition, uh, which again, I think we will be addressing, that in the sense that looked at from today, it looks inevitable, um, somehow unavoidable. Um, and yet, at the same time, in prospect, it was seemed entirely contingent and even unnecessary in some ways. So if, if, if you look at it, if you like, structurally, religious differences um, which had become politicized as, as, as you know, deep divisions, um, the emergence of a language of majorities and minorities, the language of nationhood and nations, combined with the prospect of democracy, where numbers could determine the fate of groups and individuals, that somehow, you put that all together and you think, well, partition was something bound to happen. Mm. And yet, if you look at it um, through the extraordinary parade of individuals <laughs> that were present at this time. Gandhi, Jinnah, Nehru, the Mountbatten's, Patel, and many others. What you see is the kind of sheer contingency of the moment, the sheer contingency of the discussions they had, the, the, the decisions that were taken, the numbers of ways in which those decisions could have been taken differently. And I think that's, that's that's something that is, is one of the real puzzles of partition, that it was something that no one quite wanted, yet everyone conspired to make happen. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really one of, one of the... Everyone's saying Brexit <laughs> in the audience. <laughs> I can hear you. <laughs> well, we, 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 we'll, 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 we'll come to that. So, and, it, and it's also, I think, you know, one of the kind of continuing things that fascinates people about it is, is it sort of combines this extreme horror in many ways, with also the sort of gold dust of glamour, um, the, the horror of the kind of large statistics that often get bandied about, the numbers of people killed, the numbers of people injured and raped and maimed. 
the numbers of people who migrated across borders. And then the extraordinary story, as I said, of the individuals who, who, who played a part in it. So those are, uh, and, and, and we'll, we'll come, of course, then to focus on one of those individuals in particular um, in, in the course of the discussion. But I wanted to start by just situating uh, the, the, the kind of moment in which those individuals had to live and act and choose. And what was partition, what, what was going on? And I wanted particularly, Barney, to turn to you as a military historian coming to the subject. After all, there have been many accounts of what happened. But what did you see specifically as a, as a military historian that you, you, you really wanted to bring out and you think yeah. is distinctive? Thanks. Well, I think, um, just by background, I was actually commanding the Allied forces in the south, in the south of Iraq. Um, when I um, started wanting to, to write this book. Um, because I was witnessing there um, what I thought was a similar, in a microcosmic way, situation to actually that which may have been faced in 47, in that we had um, a, a British-American occupation life, which had gone on far too long. It wasn't achieving what it had meant to achieve. But people really couldn't find an exit from it. Um, and at the same time, um, I reckoned I was suffering from that thing which the, the, the British have always done very badly which is that interface between military and, um, and political decision making. Americans, interestingly, do it much better. I think the French do it much better. It's something which this country has always done really rather badly. Um, it's got better, actually, since in, in some of the decisions taken in the 50s. So uh, I had a long, lifelong interest in India. I spent a long time there as a student. Um, and I had a long fascination with, with 47. So I wanted to explore why um, something which was in, in, inevitable in terms of independence, not partition, um, why it happened in the way it did, and how the interaction worked between the people like Mike Batten, between the Labour government in London, um, between Auchinleck, between this enormously powerful Indian army. And then the second thing, which I've never really understood about it, is why, once you had the decision to, 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 to partition, why were events in the Punjab allowed to get in the state that they did? Because if we think of a tragedy of partition, Bengal is, in a way, is a very sad story. But the immediate um, uh, the catastrophe was, it was in the Punjab. And I would maintain it needn't have happened as it did. There was a very large military force available. It was about the only thing left of the Raj, which actually functioning in 47. Everything else was Indian civil service, the, the policing, and everything had slightly fallen to bits. You still had nearly 600,000 people under arms. And the, even the year before, 47, 1946, they had absolutely rehearsed to the last detail a major breakdown of law and order in the Punjab, even to the extent of how they would protect the railways. And yet we come to June 47, we have a decision to, to go for the 15th of August. We can maybe come back to that. That is ample time for a military force. I can speak from some experience of this. <laughs> to get itself organized, to deploy, and the plans were there. And yet nothing happens. Um, and all this nonsense that you hear about, well, you couldn't put, you know, you couldn't put that regiment up in the Punjab because it had a Sikh squadron or a Sikh company. It had a Punjabi Muslim company and, 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 and a Sikh company. And fine, we didn't put it there. But you've got an awful lot of British troops sitting there who do nothing. Um, you've got a lot of Gurkhas sitting there who do nothing, who are considered to be completely neutral. And you've got large parts of the Indian Army, which is not um, class, as they um, called it, um, based. And if you look about what went wrong in the Punjab, and look what sort of come from it. That, to me, is the, the nexus of his tragedy. But you've ended up with two nuclear-armed states. You've ended up with far too much money being spent on defense when it should be spent on other things. Um, and a relationship which could have ended up, you may sound being idealistic, much as England and Scotland, has ended up as antagonistic probably as any on the globe at the moment. So why did that happen? Um, was what was Mike Batten's part in that? Certainly, we'll be sure come back to that. Um, but uh, actually, that. That breakdown of decision making, that, that, that breakdown of initiative that allowed the, the dramas in the Punjab to unfold as they did has done enormous damage. And again, I come back to where I started, you know, one saw slight parallels of that in Iraq. Mm. Mm. Good. Alex, you, you've written about um, the sort of persisting significance and kind of resonance of the moment of partition, um, both in the subcontinent and and even in this country, in fact, perhaps even more in this country. I mean, what, what do you see as that significance? Why, why is it still something that we are drawn to or need to figure out? Well, I mean, partly just to pick up on Barney's last point there, I mean, it, it still influences global history to such an enormous extent. It's still a major fault line. I mean, it's a sort of extraordinary 18 months that Britain has between sort of 1947 48 
when there are sort of three places in the world where lines are drawn on a map and off they go, and those are Pakistan, India, um, Iraq, of course, and Israel, Palestine. And you know, today I think we would all agree those are three very problematic areas of the world in terms of security risk, in terms of disruption, and so on. So, you know, I think it's sort of appropriate to assess well something, <laughs> some of those decisions that were being made, something wasn't going very well when that was happening, because this legacy is clearly still with us today. And we know it is. I mean, that border, the India-Pakistan border, is, as you know, as many people here know, is still an incredibly sort of fraught border. There is, you know, so one place you can go across, which I'm sure some of you have, I have, um, and there's this very dramatic kind of display of, of, of militarism at the border. Um, and, you know, this results from a kind of really a very short, you know, kind of period of drawing up a line on a map you know, famously by a, by a guy who had never been further than Gibraltar before from England and, you know, who sort of had this rather biblical 40 days and 40 nights to do it. Um, Cyril Radcliffe. Cyril Radcliffe, indeed. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's something that um, it seems quite extraordinary. I mean, it, it seems like such a big decision and that really needed more planning to a lot of people. And they wonder why there's now such big differences between India and Pakistan, two nations that previously you know, were integrated to some extent. I mean, British India was complicated, but certainly weren't, you know, didn't have a line going through them, which they now do. Yeah, I mean, just, just to interject there, I mean, there is a kind of, I think, a story to be written about sort of empire and, 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 and the disastrous use of partitions. I mean, if you think of the 20th century, we think of the Indian partition, but actually it was used right through, um, and it's one of the characteristic features of the 20th century. I mean, from Ireland to Palestine to to Korea, to Vietnam, to, of course, Germany, um, and, and India. And uh, nowhere have they actually turned out very well, possibly Vietnam and Germany and the kind of reunification. But in general, they haven't turned out well. Rhiannon, uh, you wrote a novel um, about this moment and about a particular figure, Edwina Mountbatten. Um, what did you think writing a novel could reveal uh, specifically that, say, writing a history didn't? Yeah, I think. We have to be very clear in our own minds when we're reading a history and when we're reading a historical novel or a faction. If you want a history and you want a careful analysis with hindsight of what went on, um, with judicious uh, interpretations of the sources, then you need to read a history. I think what a historical novelist does is they have to do a double job. They have to read the history and they have to look at primary, secondary sources. They have to know the sources. And they then write a story. But I think what historical novelists do that historians perhaps aren't allowed to do is that they are allowed to fill in the gaps. They're allowed, historical, uh, historians are not allowed to speculate about what Edwina or Pandit Nehru might have been feeling at a particular time. Historical novelists are allowed to do that. And one of the things that I was very conscious about when I was writing The Last Five Screen is we now know that partition was an absolute disaster. But they didn't know that. They knew things were not going well, and they were firefighting, and it was the end of the Second World War, and things were in pretty much general chaos. But they didn't know what were the long-term ramifications of of it were. They were living from day to day, firefighting. So by putting myself in the moment, trying to put myself in, in the character's head at the moment, and not judge them by what we know today, I think you get a different perspective on it. So you, in some ways, you, you turn the historical record inside out. What you have to be very careful of as a historical novelist is not you have to be constantly mindful that you are not putting uh, contemporary judgments or contemporary um, knowledge into people's minds. You have to try and really be there in the moment with them. And I think that's valuable because I think it opens up things to fresh interrogation. So, so let me ask you, I mean, uh, having as a novelist kind of inhabited the brain of Edwina Mountbatten uh, as you were writing this. I mean, what, what, what struck you as being really distinctive about her as a person? I think you have to understand her as a product of the time. She, she's not a modern lady. She doesn't have a Harvard MBA and a thousand followers on Twitter and whatever. She was born a rich heiress. 
she was born to educated to be a socialite and uh, run a great house. So you have to understand her in, in the context of her time and in what she was trying to do. She um, was she found a raison d'etre in relief work. She was pretty much before the war a socialite, who's the kind of lady who you might be said whose reputation preceded her. Um, and the war, she worked for the Red Cross during the war and the St. John's Ambulance, particularly the St. John's Ambulance, during the Blitz in London. And I think she found a purpose. She found a job. So when she went to India, people, she was able to hit the ground running in terms, she was a very experienced aid worker and relief worker. And I think Pandit Nehru saw what she was doing and admired her for that. Mm. So, Alex, I just wanted to bring you in here. I mean, one of the things that really strikes me about this, really about 20th century Indian history more generally, but I think if you look broadly, you see this elsewhere too, is the very close relationship um, between if you like, momentous geopolitical decisions and personal friendships. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 and, and, and kind of, there's a way in which 20th century India makes geopolitics very personal and very intimate. And I think actually that's true in general. I think that, that there's a way in which um, you know, biography and international relations and so on have never really talked to one another, but actually there, there's a lot um, uh, about this that does connect them. And I, I just wondered, in, 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 in your own account, um, and perhaps even in, 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 in the work in, in the mid-50s, um, do you, how did you sort of tra track that relationship between, between individuals, their connections, their friendships, their some, sometimes their animuses against one another, um, and these very consequential uh, international decisions that get taken? I think it's a hugely important point, and actually I think it's something that can be neglected quite easily by scholars of international relations because it seems a bit light. You know, to talk about personal friendships and relationships seems a bit of a sort of slightly fluffy, lightweight, girly subject, shall I say. Um, I don't think it is at all, actually. I think it's a very serious part of the process, and I think, you know, this transfer of power, partition, independence kind of nexus of events that you've described is one way you can actually see that the influence of um, the personalities is actually decisive at several points. I mean, you can really trace that, that it's incredibly important, the personal relationships and the decisions are made. I mean, you know, and over all sorts of things, but I mean, one particular one which Lady Mountbatten was involved in was persuading Nehru to accept a stage of dominion status for India, which previously, since 1930, he had fully rejected. Um, and, you know, that has sort of, that was done through a personal friendship, um, through a personal connection. And those, you know, that was something that several viceroys had failed to do, <laughs> and Sir Stafford Cripps. Mm. So, I mean, you know, these actually become very important, these friendships. And I think also the, as you say, the animus as well, these kind of negative relationships. For instance, Jinnah's distrust, mm. perhaps of the Mountbatten's, I think was very significant. Mm. Um, and perhaps their distrust of him, their prejudice possibly against him from fairly early on. Um, their immediate intimacy with Nehru and obviously, you know, those relationships were all very fractious as well because these, you know, these kind of, this group of men and women who had been the kind of political leadership of the Indian independence movement for decades had very personal relationships with each other as well, you know, I mean, there was an awful lot of kind of, you know, stages of sort of complicated friendships and enmities and affairs and all sorts of things and I mean, you know, like I said, I think people sometimes think that sounds lightweight, but I don't think it is, actually. I think it has tremendous uh, weight. It's critical, too. Yeah. Bernie, I mean, in, 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 I mean, you have some very interesting comments about the relationship between the civilian authorities and the military yeah. authorities and some of the tensions between this, particularly in connection with Wavell and then later with Auchinleck. Um, I mean, do you see, uh, the again, the sort of personal coming into it? And, and you also talk about how kind of Mount, Mountbatten, when he comes in, brings a very different kind of style and, 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 and approach. Uh, w what are your thoughts on that? I mean, that? They're, they're, they tie in uh, they're, they're, exactly. I mean, I absolutely agree. And that fun of having lived on the fringes of that world you know, myself. And it is still, it's, a huge, it's, a, it's an issue which I think historians consistently underplay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely true. Um, I think just before you come on to my math, I mean, the, one of the I, diaries and records I got hold of doing the book was um, there's a man called Paddy Massey who commanded the bodyguard in, um, in, in Delhi. 
And he said that the one thing that um, really seemed to infuriate the, the, the Muslim contingent in Delhi was when Nehru actually kissed Edwina Batten on the cheek as she was leaving um, in an Arab name from Delhi Airport, which is a perfectly normal thing for a westernized man like Nehru to do. I mean, they never think to do anything about it. But actually, it was <laughs> a complete sort of fury yeah. um, into, um, with many of the League supporters. But coming back to the Mike Batten relationships, um, and again, I regret to say this happens at the top of the military as it does in, in any other part of public life. There is no doubt that the, the bad relationship between Orkinlek and, and Mike Batten, mm. and actually between Orkinlek and um, and Nehru and, uh, and, and, and uh, himself and Patel <coughs> was, I think, responsible for a lot of the muddle. Mm. Um, and the history of Mike Batten being put in as Supreme Commander in Southeast Asia by Churchill, where he was um, somersaulted over the heads of many more senior experienced commanders, um, and then finds himself actually back in Delhi, having to work with one of those very people in Orkindek, who was pretty bruised because he'd been sacked by Churchill in the Middle East mm -hmm. when my had been promoted. And I think, the, again, I talked at length to one of Walking Neck's aides, who, or not him, sadly, but his son, and his dad, who actually ended up as a minister in Pakistan, um, uh, and who'd worked very closely in Orkin Neck's office and handled his correspondence with my Batten. And it, it's pretty poisonous, some of it. Mm. Um, and that lack of a good personal relationship, I think, is part of the reason that there was such a, a muddle. Mm. Um, so I would completely agree. I would just also slightly stick my neck out by saying that I think, though, I, I, I don't think Mike Batten himself was necessarily that influential in 47. Mm -hmm. um, I think he was a very good ringmaster. I think he did a, a difficult job very well. The trouble slightly to me with Mike Batten is he ascribed, particularly later in life, when perhaps his memory wasn't as good as it might have been, um, more decision-making, more power than he actually had. Um, I, mean, I mean, Mike Batten was a, was a brilliant choreographer of his own yes. history. Yes. Uh, 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 I mean, not only in the way he built his own archive, but in the television yeah. performances yeah. that he did, in the kind of selection of his biographer and so on. So it's a, uh, it's a very highly... I mean, Amble, uh, Alan Campbell Johnson, who he took as his PR yes. uh, mm -hmm. uh, person, you know, the first time mm -hmm. advice... I mean, he, 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 I think probably he may have picked up a lesson or two from Gandhi about spin yeah. and, the important, <laughs> and the importance of uh, persuading public yes. opinion. Yeah. Uh, um, but he certainly was a, mm -hmm. as a brilliant choreographer. Of his own. I think there's a, if I can say, I think there's a flip side to that as well, which is that I absolutely agree, and I think Mountbatten now is quite often blamed for the whole of the right. partition disaster. And I think that's partly because he's kind of claimed so much responsibility for things that he thought yeah. bigged him yeah. up. Yeah. But now it's used to knock him down. Mm. And actually, I mean, there's certainly elements he's responsible for. I'm not here to mount a defense mm. of the man, but I absolutely agree that he's less important, actually, yeah. in those yeah. decisions. It's, it's a lesson to us all. Be careful how important you claim to yeah, be. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> yes. um, yes. um, I, I want to come to uh, Edwina Mountbatten. It's clear that you know, the best thing that ever happened to that couple was India. Uh, I, I mean, it's not clear that the best thing that ever happened to India was that, couple. <laughs> but, 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 but um, <laughs> it's clearly that way around. Uh, I, one of the things that I, I think uh, strikes me is that um, the, her, her glamour, her style, her, her presence has actually overshadowed um, what I think is her real skill and achievement and... Um, extraordinary capacity as, as, a, as a person and as a player. Um, I, I, you know, I think she, 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 she you, you mentioned her, you know, discovering through St. John's Ambulance a yeah. role and so on, but I, I would say actually that she is a very important political figure yeah, exactly. in the history of this country as well. Um, I mean, she was a radical anti-establishment figure right from the 30s. She kind of, as a woman, took a very, you know, independent line in many ways. Uh, this continued not just in India, but then afterwards into the 1950s. She, she was someone who the, the CIA, the British government, you know, really was scared of. Yeah, yeah. They really worried about, you know, what she was doing or not going to do or, you know, who she was going to speak to, the kind of... And, and so I, I think that, um, you know, I think also she plays an important role in the, this country's struggle to deal with racism. Um, I think, you know, whether it's her, her in, uh, engagement with and involvement with uh, black, black African-Americans exactly. in the 1930s, 
um, her involvement in India, her picking up of the cause of Kenya and the African uh, uh, nation, colonial nation, st uh, nation states to be in the 1950s. So I think we, we kind of underplay her as a political figure. I think her reputation for promiscuity has, has definitely um, under, underplayed her, her, her role. Well, that's a reputation that men have given yeah. her. I mean, uh, it is a reputation that men have given her. Yeah. And it's also and a reputation that men are allowed to have without that. Yeah, being exactly. Them on exactly. <laughs> and, and, right. um, I think she, she was a woman of considerable power and influence, but behind the scenes. And um, I think her big question to me when I was writing The Last Vice Queen is did her relationship, what were the, were if, were there any political implications of the relationship, friendship between Edwina and Pandit Nehru? Did it impact on the outcome? Did it impact on partition? This was something I sort of thought about. And I thought, doing my research, that actually, time and time again, when you're researching Edwina Mountbatten, you read about two people in the room, two blokes, usually, who hate each other and don't like each other, and they're invited for dinner at at Viceroy's house, as it then was, and Edwina is there, and she heroically keeps the whole thing going, keeps the people talking, keeps, keeps things going. She tried very, very hard with, um, with the Jinners and didn't get anywhere. Um, so I think her role was in keeping people talking, keeping things going, and as Alex has mentioned, in keeping India in the Commonwealth um, yep. as well. You know, so, uh, yes, and she was a rebel, absolute rebel, you know. Um, and people talk about Lady Diana, you know, going out and breaking moulds and going into hospitals and kissing people and putting her arms around aid victims and things. Edwina went to the Punjab time and time and time again. And there's pictures of her. She has destitute, filthy women in her arms, grud grotty children in her arms, and she's down on her knees in the dust. Yeah. She was not a sort of traditional vice in, in that sense. No, I mean, I, I, think, you know, I think she's an extraordinarily fierce character um, and, and, you know, very, very driven by her commitments, um, which were not the usual commitments no. of, of someone in her position. Yeah. Um, I mean, Alex, in, 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 in the story you tell about 1947, um, I mean, can, can you also, can, there were also a number of extraordinary Indian women who were yeah, involved uh, in, in this story. I mean, can you sort of touch on, on some of them and, and sort of bring, bring them into the story as well? I think it, it's very important, that actually, and it's something that I noticed, in, I noticed in my book, try and remember the statistic now and I'll probably get it wrong because, you know, 11 years ago, memory fades. Um, but I think at the time there were more kind of active, high-level women in Congress in India than there were in comparable Western parties, yeah, certainly if you compare right. it to the Labour Party in Britain yes, or yes. Democrats in the US. that Lady Mountbatten actually admired. She really yes, admired she it. She really and admired she, it. People like Amrit Kaur. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Sajjani Naidu, exactly. you know, Naidu. I mean, yes. you know, and, and Pandit, Vijay Pandit. Absolutely. absolutely. And a lot of these people became very close friends with Edwina. Um, you know, she um, was really impressed by was. Indian women was. when she went to I mean, India. I do think that that's an important context in which to look at it, because she's usually located in this kind of male world um, in which I think she plays a very important role. But I think actually this was part of a larger mm. role uh, and, 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 and impact that women were making at this time. Absolutely. Um, and I mean, Am Amrit Kaur, I think, was probably her closest friend yes. at that time. Um, but, I, you know, she did go on very well. And people like Nan Pandit are sort of extraordinary. You know, I think we now... I think there's a sense in which we sort of forget, actually, how many powerful women there were yeah, in no, the sort of mid 20th century. We think feminism's, you know, a sort of 1970s phenomenon, but actually, you go and back. They to were the making and, world history. Yeah, she I was saying that's things that's like she hoped, you know, she was seeing women in taking office, people like Amrit Kaur in in, in India when she became uh, Minister of Health, I think, in Nehru's yeah. first cabinet. You know that this was fantastic. This was well ahead of what was going in the West, and and you know she was r really, really, uh, yeah, you know. Right. And again, that's an assumption. And that the British no one really seemed to. Um, I mean, when she took over, she, she took over leadership of the basically the refugee committees. So there were. 25, 30 different organizations which come into being. And so Ridula Sarabai was another yeah. woman who, who played an important role. I mean, sorry, in that, yeah, yeah. sorry, in that. Um, but what is what interests me with that is the how that seemed to happen really sort of almost naturally. There didn't seem to be any, and even um, Nyoji, the, um, the, the, the Bengali politician who actually became the first minister for uh, 
um, for refugees that then became Minister of Rehabilitation. Uh, the, the working relationship that um, she established with him, um, you know, we sort of slightly take for granted now because we're quite used to, mm. <laughs> to, to women playing that role. But actually, I remember thinking at the time, gosh, it's actually, even with the, you know, with the tradition of sort of, of charitable memsobs, which always had a slight element of condescension about it, but which actually was something I think people understood, um, she slotted into that role um, and, and ran it. And again, you look at the minutes of some of the, the, the meetings that she chaired. Um, and some of the very practical measures that were brought in as a result of that, and some of the relief measures, um, it is, it's hugely impressive. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Uh, coming back to the, uh, the question that, in, in a sense, sort of haunts your book, um, yeah. which I think also comes from your pr practical mm. experience in Iraq and in Basra, this, this point about you know, when is the right time to get out? Um, <laughs> and in a sense, uh, that's a question that every empire should actually live under the guillotine of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 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 and of course, you know, the British had a, 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 a strong concept. You know, the right time to get out was when Indians were ready. Uh, but who <laughs> determines when Indians were ready? Well, the British would determine when yeah. Indians were ready. Uh, in the end, they were kind of uh, they couldn't quite time it uh, as they wanted to. But how how do yeah. you see this issue, particularly if you like from a military point of view? I mean. I <laughs> The book that needs to be written is what happened to British collective decision making after the First World War. Um, because we go, as a country, we go very wrong somewhere after that. Um, and if you look at Ireland, where I've spent a lot of my life, um, and you look at India, you know, there are some pretty disastrous decisions made. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, equally, there are some really quite sensible decisions made. So, um, and, and if, if you listen to, to what Congress was saying, saying, well, why is it different for Canada, Australia? Why is it different for South Africa? Yeah. Um, is it different for India because we're a different colour? Um, and the answer is, if you're some conservative politicians, that probably was actually the answer. Mm -hmm. um, so you get that very muddled period. And if you look at the 1920s, you know, so much argued for a, a, you know, a, a, proper, a, proper, a, a proper handover then. Um, you had the Indian contribution to the First World War, which was enormous, not just in, in manpower. And, the, and some of the handling of, that, of, of the Indian soldiers was not particularly clever, um, but particularly in France. Um, you had enormous financial contribution. You had a real scaling down of any sort of uh, trouble or unrest, there was unrest. Um, and you have this expectation which had been built up that actually come 1918, come the end of the war, everything else going on in the world, 14 points it out, you would actually have some form of, of, of solution. And then you have Amritsar and, 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 and you have the role of Axe and you have that extraordinary retrenchment which there is no logic for. I mean, forgive me for saying this, but the British Army, it does not, some of the audience may disagree, but the British Army is not an organisation that goes around shooting unarmed demonstrators. Um, it, it has done it occasionally in its history where things have gone badly wrong. But Amritsar is completely out of mm -hmm. character for, um, for, for the Indian Army. It is an extraordinary event, and even Churchill you know, describes it as such. Um, so there's, there's something sort of missing in our analysis, and we do the same thing in, in Ireland. We do the same thing in Dublin in 1916. Extraordinary events, and look what they've actually kicked off now. And actually, if somebody had reacted rather more sensibly in 1916 in Dublin, we wouldn't have the, you know, that partition. Um, th that we have. So, and then, sorry, lastly, and I'll shut up, but the, also in Nigeria, any trade advantage, any financial advantage from, from India has started to dissipate. Um, you know, the, all of, 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 of the tariff um, preferences <coughs> have, have gone, and actually India starts becoming you know, an expense, and the Indian civil service starts falling apart. There's absolutely no logic for not actually finding an earlier solution, and that is a fascinating question. But, but uh, yeah. what, what's, I think, very powerful uh, that comes across in your book is also the, the, the unwillingness to deploy the military to yeah. provide its powers of protection. Yes. Um, and I think that seems to me one of the great kind of, you know, one yeah. can get away from the question, of, or one can set aside the mm. complex question of responsibility for why partition, etc., happened. But the withdrawal of the protective obligation yeah. of military yeah. force, yeah. I think, is one of the great, um, uh, the great kind of blots uh, on, on, on mm. the end, end, end of empire. Because as you, as you mm. say, I mean, you know, it was, the, there was talk mm. about deploying the British military to protect mm. British yeah. subjects. But uh, indeed, even in Kashmir, uh, you know, when the conflict starts there, but not for Indians. Yeah. Alex, you wanted to... Oh, I just, I wanted to come back a bit on a point about Amritsar, actually, because I think, um, I know that there's a book coming out next year, which I'm quite interested in about yeah. it, by Dr. Kim Wagner, about 
um, Amritsar Massacre particularly, and he's arguing, and I, I think he's got a good point, although I haven't read the book yet, it's not finished yet as far as I understand, but actually Amritsar is a less exceptional event, I think, than we often assume it was. I think the colonial, um, the entire colonial control was about violence, and there was actually constant violence in India between people protesting or rejecting the regime and between that being hit back and you know there were military campaigns every year in India there were you know also there was also extreme you know it was not a kind of quiet happy time the colonial times and and I think the sort of attempt by somebody like Churchill to present Amritsar as a as a completely exceptional event that bore no relation to anything else the British were doing in India is kind of a justification of empire actually. Yeah. Right on, yeah. I just want to make a, a small point. We're saying that the, the British stayed too long, and I, I wouldn't dispute that. But um, I think the, the British, compared to the French, the British actually got out of their colonies fairly quickly after the war, it seems to me. I don't know, you know, in comparison, the French tried to hang on. I think after the war, we didn't. We didn't hang on. We, we you know, we'd learned lessons from America from the Civil War, and once... Mm -hmm. Once the, I think the British Empire was run on a shoestring, actually, and once it started to get too difficult, we we just we just let it go. Uh, okay. I mean, uh, I don't. Yeah, what? Yeah. Let, let, let's let's not get because that, that is that. another yeah. question. But I, I want to come back to this question about um, this issue of you know the the importance of women in these political kinds of developments. I mean, it seems to me that you know you could locate someone like Edwina Mountbatten in a genealogy which goes all the way back to Annie Besant, really. I mean, the, 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 these, these extraordinary figures who, who you know, take yeah. up uh, causes and commitments which are not naturally their own uh, and really go out on a limb. And I guess I'd be interested to, to hear from, from, from all of you. I mean, you know, how, how could one start to write histories, novels, films, whatever they might be, that start to kind of bring that back in much more because they have been very these very separate worlds um you know the biographies of eccentric women and then the kind of hard subject of global politics and and and, mm -hmm. and, and international relations and so on and it seems to me actually the interesting thing is really how we start to connect those yeah. strands yeah yeah oh god just to start with <laughs> um, i mean i think this is part of a very important project which has been going on for many years, you know, with kind of subaltern history, feminist history, women's history, and all sorts of different types. We've been trying to bring these stories back and perhaps reframe history in a different way. Um, and I mean, I think it's something that actually film, TV, and novels do very well, because of course there is a problem with sources, and there always is, yeah. is, you know, that if you historically written, it, we depend on written sources more than anything else, especially when you go back before photography, before recording, and so on. Um, and it is highly like and literacy tends to be limited to you know you're more likely to be literate if you are male if you are you know upper middle class if you are all sorts of other things you know so it, it's it's sometimes quite hard to retrieve those women's voices obviously when you've got somebody like um, Edwina Mountbatten despite her completely terrible education she could at least read and write and kept you know sort of documents uh, I do think there's also you know in the, actually with specific regard to her I think there's something just to pick up on your earlier point about how we reconstruct that very interesting history of her sort of anti-colonial politics and so on and, and her influence in the 50s, um, it's very hard to do so because uh, the families still won't let us look at the letters between Edwina Mountbatten and Javala Nehru. And I think if we were able to read those, I very much doubt they would actually be all that scandalous. Um, but I imagine they would be very interesting from the point of view of decision-making in 1950s politics, and I think they'd be a great asset to historians, but yeah. sadly I'm not in charge of whether I'm allowed no. to read them or not. No. <laughs> from I mean, the I, point of view of military history. Well, well, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, the topic is, uh, the, the, I think you've got to separate between biography and history. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, with history, you've got to look at the, the, the evidence, the, the sources that are there relating to, to historical events. Um, and whether you know, we like it or not, as Alex has just said, um, uh, until fairly recently, most of those are written about men from a, from a, a male perspective, not, um, not entirely. Um, so I think, on the other hand, there is a very strong argument to be made for doing more biographical work if the sources yeah. um, can be found and sort of coming at it from that point of view. But I do think, from a historical point of view, one's got to be very careful about approaching history from an angle. Mm -hmm. I think you've got to write history objectively. Mm 
because I think if you succumb at it uh, from too much of an angle, then it, you know, it actually loses an awful lot of its value. So, and the historian can do nothing without sources. Um, you know, and then otherwise, as, yeah. as we said at the beginning, one yeah. is drifting into, yeah. into a novel. Yeah. I mean, a quick yeah. comment, and then we'll open it up for questions. Yeah, I think, I think the two things work together. I think you have to be, like I said, you have to be clear what you're doing. Um, so I think there's a place, there's a place for both. But the, the problem comes when, you, when you're trying to, as a historian, get into somebody's head and hypothesise, perhaps, about the thinking process or the emotional. What would the impact be, for example, on, on Auchinleck, Al whose wife had left him? What kind mm. of emotional state was he in? Mm. Um, Barney's talked about mm. the, the, the decision-making process. But... Um, Orkinleck's wife left him for uh, another military man not, sh not long before 1947. So what impact? It's people's emotional states mm -hmm. that, that are interesting and that historians don't really get, it, get into that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's difficult because you have to source things. You have to be, you have to be able to back things up. Um, I was always very clear that I would, when I was writing that I would need to justify what, what I was No, I, I think that's right. But, of course, a lot of human life and interaction is also about reading what's between the lines. Yeah. I mean, we spend a you know, much part of the, our day doing that. Yes. So yes. I think there's no reason why historians shouldn't yeah. do that, too. Um, okay, let's, 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 let's open that up to, to questions. Um, we'll go yeah, in the back there and then there and then there. And please keep your questions short. Certainly, shortest one you can ever get. <laughs> These historical records, true, re true reflection of what actually happened on the ground in India, <clears throat> excuse me, or distorted by civil servants. <laughs> okay, we'll, ta we'll take a second question together with that. So, yeah. Sorry, this question is uh, directed at Rihanna. Uh, I'm, I just wanted to ask you know, there was obviously a relationship between uh, Nehru and uh, Edwina. Um, whether in her research, uh, or in your research, that you came across uh, the effect of that on, on Jinnah. Because obviously, you know, you've got a, a relationship there which is more than just a peck, a, you know, a peck on the cheek. And I just wondered whether your, your research brought up any of that and the effect on Nehru's wife. Nehru's wife was dead, dead. so Nehru's that's, wife that's is dead. quite some years ago. Yeah. Um, okay, so the civil servants manipulating the, <laughs> the record to, for their own purposes. Uh, quick, so, quick yeah. comment on uh, that. Uh, actually, one, one of the things, you could argue, one of the few, the few things that um, Harold Wilson's government did <laughs> really well was um, record, uh, record the, the events of the 1930s and 1940s in India. The Indian office record is, is a particularly full one. Um, it is written inevitably from the perspective of British civil servants because a lot of it is um, British official correspondence. But it was edited by a man called Pendle Moon, who perhaps was one of the, the more understanding and sympathetic. Um, there is the, the Indian archive of, 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 of the same period, which is a, a multi-volume, which you've probably seen. Um, and actually what's so interesting about that is it combines internal letters between um, senior members of Congress um, and um, it includes also quite a lot of press articles, relevant press articles. And that's the ICHR, mm. and there's volumes and volumes. Towards freedom. Of, uh, to, to, yeah. Towards freedom, which is a fantastic resource. The place where there's a real lack of record is Pakistan. Um, mm. And what I would love is for um, the, the, where the, the Gino archive really exists mm. and whether it wasn't destroyed, I would really love to, to get what was actually really happening in, inside the league. And that, to me, is the great gap in this. Mm -hmm. I really agree, yeah. Ryan, a quick comment. Yeah, um, I mean, this is, this is a big question. We don't mm -hmm. actually know, but it is likely that it, it perhaps increased the sense of alienation. It's well known that the, the Jinners and the Mountbatten's didn't get on. They tried very hard. The Mountbatten's tried very hard with uh, Jinnah um, and his sister. Um, and I think the, 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 the fact that Nehru uh, and Edwina were clearly getting on very well perhaps didn't help, didn't help matters, but Alex might have something. No, I mean, there's a story, yes. I mean, it's whether it's true or not, always, you know, these things kind of come up as gossip and it's unverifiable, but that um, in July 47, so shortly before the transfer of power, that Jinnah was passed a, a packet of letters that had gone between Nehru and Lady Mountbatten, uh, which were apparently quite intimate, a bit racy, some, uh, some quite fun details in there. And it is said that Jinnah looked at these and he actually said... Caesar's wife should be above suspicion, and he gave them back and didn't use them. 
which, if so, is really rather remarkable and definitely a different era than we're living in now, I would say. Yeah. Um, but I think there's, yeah, I mean, there's a difficult relationship there. I, I think it did affect the relationship, but it's sort of slightly chicken and egg, depending on when you think this relationship started, whether Jinnah and Fatima Jinnah's kind of, you know, slight coldness towards the Mountbatten Mountbatten's might have been a result of the Nehru relationship or whether, you know, which way around that went, if you see what I mean. I'm not sure about the July 47 date on that, but um, 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 yeah, yeah, we had we a couple of questions. Yeah, here and then here. I just wish to set the record straight because when you talked about uh, partition and that they didn't know what to expect about what would happen, they were just firefighting day to day. There was an earlier partition, the first partition of Bengal, which mm -hmm. happened in 1906. Yeah. And it 1905. was such a great yeah. disaster. It was so terrible that finally they reunified Bengal in 1911. Yeah. And memories are not that short that you don't know what's going to happen or how bad it's going to get. So it wasn't really a firefighting that they just suddenly realized it was going to be so terrible Thank and so bad. We're, 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 this line was almost exactly the same in 1947 yeah. as in 1905. Yeah. 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 Hi, just a quick comment and uh, to add to the lady's comment about uh, get, getting the history accurate. Oh, sorry, I can't um, hear you. Sorry, um, the military gentleman said mm. that the British Army doesn't go around massacring civilians who are peacefully protesting. Mm. As someone half Irish, I just really have to say, 1972 Bloody Sunday, um, 28 civilians shot at during a, a, a civil rights protest, and the official inquiry declared that it was unjust and unjustified. So just want to set the record straight with regards to that. I, let's talk about India. Question. Uh, ooh, yeah, here and then there. Yes. Um, oh, thank you. Okay, go ahead, and then we'll take it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I've been holding my hand for a long time. I'm yeah. glad that I've been recognised. Um, with reference to the lady who brought up the um, subject about the 1905, the partition of Bengal by Lord Curzon, and there was a man. Mr. C.R. Das, under him, Bengal was united in 1911. I wonder why you left that out. There were two partitions. One was in 1905, only with regard to Bengal. And later on, the other partition, partition was in 1947. And well, because there were, we were talking, just a moment, we were just a moment. can I finish what I'm saying? Yeah? Then there was yeah. this partition of Bengal and the partition of Punjab. Lastly, I would like to know that you have talked quite at length about the relationships between Mr. Nehru and Ms. Mrs. Uh, Edwina Curry. Uh, sorry, Edwina uh, <laughs> Mountbatten. <laughs> uh, Edwina Mountbatten. I beg your pardon. Yes. That would be interesting. And of course, wow. the the reactions of the Jinnahs. But you left out the evidence, the historical evidence of wrongdoing that the British were engaged in especially with regard to the Mesopotamian scandal. There's something not wrong with the British people, but something definitely wrong with the decision-making process in the Westminster government. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, uh, let's, uh, yeah, you'll have your yeah, hand. Um, if you get the microphone, please. So just. Um, I had got a, gotten into a spat with you when I mentioned Perry Anderson three years ago at the South Bank. Uh, why uh, would I? say anything bad about parents? Um, <laughs> the thing is that Nehru lied and manipulated things. I'll tell you from an example. My grandma's brother was um, the high court chief justice of Allahabad, and their house was next door to Anand Bhavan. And um, Feroz Gandhi's father was a Muslim. He was a he was a greengrocer uh, and a wine Parsi. seller. He was Parsi. No, his mum was Parsi. <laughs> his mum was Parsi. My family, my grandma used to talk about this all the time. Okay, so, but so your question is? Sir? Is that th the truth was manipulated. Uh, Congress manufactured fake news. Okay, great. Okay, um, any, any comment on that? Uh, no. Okay, so let's take another round and then... Uh, See, just so we can get as many voices in. Uh, yeah, you, you in the middle, yeah, in the black shirt. Thank you. Um, Alex particularly has talked about the importance of relationships. Mm. I was wondering if that extends to the present day, given the enormous uh, uh, power on, on, on the current royal family that Lord Manbatten's memory seems to exercise. Um, I think 
absolutely relationships are still important in politi politics today. I don't think the British royal family are particularly important in politics today. But it is true that they do seem to have a tremendous lasting affection towards Mountbatten. The, uh, the new prince uh, is, is called Prince Louis. Um, uh, hopefully not to become the king of the swingers, the jungle VIP. I think that was King Louis. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and actually the oldest child as well, the older prince, uh, Prince George, his middle name is Louis as well. So they've got two Louis in one family. So that's, that's you know, a hefty Mountbatten influence. Um, as to whether, uh, so I, I mean, I think Mountbatten's influence on Prince Charles has been written about quite extensively. Um, and that does seem to be coming down generations. The royal family's name, although they are the House of Windsor, their name, as we know, from when they signed the marriage register, their surname is Mountbatten Windsor. So, so he got there. Okay, so yeah. we've got one question back there and then one here. Yeah, yeah this is mainly directed to, uh, to, to Barney with regard to you know, his military um, background and research. Uh, in these recent programs on partition, over the 70th anniversary of the partition, there was something about uh, it being a more of a strategic move in that uh, Britain wanted uh, a base in Pakistan uh, because uh, the partition was, uh, you know, was, was, was imminent just to counter the threat of Russia uh, you know, as part of the big game. Is, is that true? Make a quick comment. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't hold with this, I'm afraid. And um, there is a film, which I mentioned, which came out last year, which um, made quite a lot of it. Um, and let's just also be clear that Churchill exercised no power in Westminster yeah. after July 1945. Yeah, and um, So I'm afraid I just don't hold. And again, I can assure you, the British government isn't that joined up. That film is based on a book by a man called Sarilla, which was actually itself based on very thin evidence, really, on mm. that. Um, there was, yeah, a question here, yeah. We'll take two together, yeah. Can we? Is it working? Yes. Yeah. I've got a question for Barney, please. Um, to what extent, if at all, was the British Army involved with the logistics at the time of partition? You know, this huge movement of people going the same roads. So I'm wondering, to what extent um, the British were responsible for all the, you know, totally obvious, from my perspective, bloodshed? But also I would like to briefly endorse what was said about the situation in Ireland. Um, my grandfather's second cousin was Michael Collins. And so I have a certain amount of family knowledge, but definitely, you know, the atrocities and the inhumanity, one only has to look at the letters of Maud Gaunt, W.B. Yeats, and look at autobiography to realize that atrocities and inhumanity, that was the hallmark of the British. And that is how they are remembered. Okay, I mean, I think to be fair to me, I did say that 1916 was a, you know, one of the worst things the British Army did, to be fair. Um, so um, let's not, but let's talk about India. Um, the, in the Punjab, yeah, when the tragedy is that if they had made more use of that enormous military presence, that they had 600,000 people, its own hospitals, its own factories, its own schools, its own farms, um, its own transport system, um, if that had been put in place in the Punjab, quite apart from the job they could have done protecting people, then that, I think that would have made a major, major difference. And that is the, the point I make in the book. But I do also think that it isn't just um, sort of Autonex my Batten's fault. Um, Nehru didn't trust armies. To, to, to Nehru, armies were there to break up and uh, attack Congress. He didn't, he didn't have any experience of dealing with them. Yes. The only man who came near to it was Patel, interestingly. Mm -hmm. So I think it could have made a major difference. We've got a few minutes left. We'll just take yeah, that. Three, three quick comments. Yeah. Can I quickly also Very bring quickly. in 1930s Palestine? The British army were not there to keep the peace, but perhaps they thought they were keeping the peace by being violent towards protesters. Okay, can we 1920s keep the questions on, on oh, that's the, the British the Empire. Of this session, yeah. <laughs> but I think you should comment on yeah. that. Maybe okay. not okay. being denial and about and it. I'd, I'd love to talk about the Palestine white paper. The, the gentleman behind and then back there, please. Yeah. Wasn't, wasn't there an effort by Lord Mountbatten? To Sorry, could you speak up, please? Uh, wasn't there an effort by Lo Lord Mountbatten, right at the 11th hour, to become the governor general of both India and Pakistan, which would have undermined the partition and created much greater chaos? Oh, yes. I'm going, uh, uh, I'm just going. Let's just take one final comment, and then we'll come back to the panel. I'd just like to comment on massacres by the British Army. If we oh, go no, back yeah. to... <laughs> We, 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 we need a whole session on that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, William, 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 will you note that? Will you note that? Okay, you note that? okay, okay thank you. So we're running out of time. Let's just uh, take. Can I? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> oh, okay, go what ahead. about 1931 in Peshawar when your forces massacred up to 400 unarmed protesters? Yeah. 
Okay, let's let's talk about forty-seven. Otherwise, I think we will um, get two sides. So, Barney, let, let's just uh, run. Yeah, let, let me just talk about the governor general point with Mount Batten. Yeah. Well, I think that's actually one of the more sensible things Mount Batten tried to do. I think if Jenner hadn't been dying, he might well have agreed to it. Actually, if I know. The, um, but I think he realised that the chaos would, would, um, would result if he'd been prime minister and, and, and died in Pakistan. I think the, um, what we've got to remember is that in June, there was a structure set up. There was a joint military command. There was envisaged that Pakistan and Indian forces would work together. And they did, actually, to some extent, in the Punjab in a very minor way. There was, and, that, and that joint sort of command structure, if you like, was designed to, to last for some time. And having a joint governor general, and the point that Alex made about, about Nehru Green coming in as a dominion, it was hugely important. And I think, actually, I'm quite a fan of Jinnah. I think Jinnah was a great man. Um, I think one of the biggest mistakes he made was actually um, not to, to go with Mike Batten on that. And it did cause an you know, a, a, a even worsening of that already delicate relationship. Okay, Rhiannon, do you want to make a quick final comment and then... Um, about, uh, well, I would Any just like to say um, people find it very difficult to understand, many people in India find it very difficult to understand the relationship between Edwina Mountbatten and Pandit Nehru. I don't think it's that difficult to understand at all. Um, we could talk in more detail about that. But when I was thinking about it, I thought, Do you know what, Edwina was actually India's first first lady. As the wife of the Governor General of India, she was, in fact, and, and Nehru had no wife of his own. So, actually, she was playing a, a real leading role at a very difficult time in India. It's not mm. politically correct to say that, but she, she actually, if you, mm. if you think of her like that, then perhaps you can understand how their friendship developed. Great. Thank you, Alex. Well, I don't know whether I should come in on, you know, governor generals or imperial atrocities or... Personal relationships. I mean, but I suppose what I can say with all of this is that actually, my goodness, doesn't this subject cover everything? I mean, <laughs> you know, and this is why actually we're still fascinated by it today. Yes, I think yeah. the sort of 1947-48 is that it brings in so much, and I really think you know. And I'm just going to make a small plea that British schools need to start teaching it. Actually, we don't. We don't learn about it, and I think it's really I mean, obviously important to that keep them in the so key, that. Yeah, and I, it's I, important I, beyond that. I, I think that's right, and it's actually it's kind of you know thinking about the sort of Commonwealth connection. It, it, there's almost a way in which this the, these relationships become a metaphor for what what kind of Britain is trying to negotiate at the moment um, with, 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 with India, a kind of more open, um, more equal. Um, uh, Form of relationship, which I think you know, the 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 the, the uh, Edwin Batten is a very interesting kind of symbol of that in 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 many ways. So, okay, well, thank you very much. Um, we have pretty much covered the entire history of the 20th century. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, thank you. Well done, <laughs> to all of you.